right, let's see if we're going. Let's see if my microphone works. It looks like nothing is coming through on the YouTubes, but let's see if that works. Hello, everybody. It looks, sorry, I'm just looking over here to make sure we're live. I think we're actually live now. Welcome to another live stream office hours Q&A. Thanks for being here. If you're here live, let me know in the chat where you're uh, where you're watching from. If you're watching on the replay, let me know in the comments where you're watching from. Sorry, I was uh, doing a late start, so let's see if everything's actually working. Let's go ahead and close this. And it looks like we're here. John is here from England. Awesome. Thanks for being here, John. Glad to have you here. And so this one, we don't really have a topic plan. We're just doing a, a Q&A. So I have some questions that people have sent me and some stuff from the comments. So we'll just be answering some questions. If you have some questions you wanna ask, you can, if you're here live, you can leave them in the chat and we'll answer those questions. If you're watching on the replay, go ahead and uh, leave a question in the comments and we can uh, make sure we get to it next time. I just, I kind of rearranged everything, so I'm trying to make sure everything's uh, still set up correctly and everything still works. I've been recording the um, formula review course. I'm going back through and recording that, so I kind of move some stuff around, so I want to make sure my microphone still works, my level still works. I think we're good to go. Let's answer some questions. First one was left on the comments. Dung Tron is asking about Yi Ping Feng Song. And this is something we talked about in the formula review course. Uh, Yi Ping Feng Song, this formula is used as a preventative. And when we look at the diagnostic factors, we say the pulse is floating. And normally we use this only for prevention. And so he's saying, is the, he's asking, is the floating pulse the sign of an exterior attack? This is a good question. This is an interesting question. So just to catch everybody up here, we're talking about we're talking about Yi Ping Feng Song. Everything's backwards when you're in a camera. When you're on camera, we're talking about Yi Ping Feng Song Jade Windscreen Powder. Uh, the main ingredients are Huang Qi, Bai Ju, and Feng Feng. And so this is something. This is a formula we use to prevent an external attack. So this is for deficiency on the exterior and the deficiency of the Wei Qi. So this is very commonly used when you have someone who gets sick easily. We often see this in like, uh, sometimes parents will come in with their children and they'll say, oh, my child gets, he catches a cold every month. Or you have somebody that they say, every time there's a sickness going around the office, I always catch it. And so this is something that we can use to strengthen the Wei Qi to prevent an exterior attack. So if you remember, Huang Qi is in the category herbs that tonify Qi, but one of its major actions is it stabilizes the exterior and stops sweating. Uh, Baiju, same thing, it's in the category tonify Qi. We normally think of it as spleen Qi tonic, but it also has this action of stabilizing the exterior and stopping sweating. And so that's why we say that this one is used for prevention, that it's strengthening the exterior so that pathogens can't get in. The thing is, if you already have an exterior attack, if you already have those fever and chills and you already feel sick, we don't want to use this formula. We don't want to strengthen the exterior. We don't want to stop sweating. When you have an exterior attack, our treatment principle is to use acrid herbs that promote sweating and push the pathogen out. So if we're trying to promote sweating and push the pathogen out, we don't want to use herbs that strengthen the exterior, stop sweating, and hold things in. That's the exact opposite of what we want. So here, we're making a wind screen. We're blocking the wind with a screen made of jade so that the wind can't get in. But if we have an exterior attack, we don't want to use this formula. We want to use acrid exterior releasing formulas that promote sweating and push the pathogen out. And I think this is an important point to make just because a lot of people look at this formula or they look at Huang Qi and they think in Western terms. They think that if I got sick, I need to strengthen my immune system. And they think that herbs like Huang Qi, because they're good for the lung Qi, they're good at strengthening the immune system. So if I get sick, I need to take these herbs to strengthen my immune system so I can fight off the pathogen. That is not how Chinese medicine works. Even if we go back to our uh, fundamentals book, I don't have my Nigel Weissman here, but if we go back to our fundamentals book, when we talk about treatment strategies, we even say that when there's an external attack, 
our treatment strategy is not to support the upright chi. Our treatment strategy is to attack the pathogen. Remember, they're thinking about this in martial terms, in terms of a battle. If somebody's invading, you attack the pathogen. And for that, we use acrid herbs that promote sweating and push the pathogen out. After the pathogen is gone, then we can go back and rebuild the upright chi or rebuild the, the fluids or the other things that may have been damaged by the pathogen. But when we have that external attack, we're, not, we're generally not supporting the upright chi. We're focusing on attacking the pathogen. So that's why something like Yi Ping Feng San would not be the correct thing to do if we, we want to, again, attack the pathogen. But anyway, the question is here, when we look at this uh, formula, we notice that our pulse is a floating pulse. You say floating, deficient, and frail. Deficient and frail is pretty obvious because we're dealing with a deficiency condition. The Wei Qi is deficient, so it makes sense that we have a deficient pulse. But what the question was is, if we have a floating pulse, doesn't a floating pulse mean we're dealing with an exterior attack? And the short answer is not necessarily. And so I actually, I got my Volker Scheid so we can, we can see exactly what he says. So if you look in Jade Windscreen Powder, Yi Ping Feng San, it will say the shiny pale complexion and pale tongue reflect deficiency of Qi. So we have a deficiency of Wang Qi and deficiency of Wei Qi while the floating deficient and soft pulse reflects weakness in the superficial levels of the body's energies. And so basically here he's saying the, the superficial pulse has to do with the fact that it's an exterior condition, not necessarily that there's a pathogen on the exterior. So I guess maybe to kind of clear this up, what we could say is that a floating pulse doesn't necessarily mean there's an exterior pathogen attacking the surface. A floating pulse just means we're dealing with an exterior condition. Like when we talk about eight principal diagnosis, we can say something as hot or cold, excess or deficient, and interior or exterior. Well, if we have a deep pulse, that means we're dealing with an interior condition. If we have a floating pulse, that means we're dealing with an exterior condition. But it just so happens in this case, when we say an exterior condition, we don't need, mean a pathogen is on the exterior. We don't mean that there's an evil environmental chi on the exterior. We mean that the exterior is deficient. And so that's why we see a floating weak pulse, because the exterior is deficient. So, so to answer the, the question, um, that was kind of a long roundabout way, but really what we mean here is that uh, the floating, in this case, the floating pulse does not mean that there's an exterior pathogen. The floating pulse just means that the exterior, the Wei Qi, the upright Qi, the body's Qi on the exterior is deficient. It doesn't necessarily den denote that there's a, a pathogen. So, that, so that's a really good question, and that's something I like to bring up a lot about Yi Ping Feng San, that a lot of people think that this is a good way to fight off a pathogen when really we want to use it as a preventative measure. Hopefully that made sense. Alex is here. Good morning, Alex. Vijay, past comps, awesome, congratulations. Um, would, I, I guess, do you do, you do all comps? Because at my school they started splitting up where we have like points and foundations comps, and then next semester you take herbs comps. I think some people with their preclinical -pre exams, they take everything all at once. So whatever you, whatever you took, congratulations. Like strong. Hey, everyone. Hey, how's it going? Uh, Yiping Feng Song can also be used in people that have a lot of heat, like chronic heat. I'm, I wouldn't necessarily go there. Um, it's because there's nothing in this formula that really clears heat. Um, so if people have a lot of chronic heat, I would think about using formulas that clear heat or tonify yin. Yi Ping Feng San, it's like Huang Qi and Bai Ju are already kind of warming herbs, and they're more about sealing the exterior and stopping the sweating. So it's more about Qi deficiency, not necessarily deficiency heat. Oh yeah, PCOM. So yeah, yeah, I know. In, I think in PCOM they started doing it so that you your herb, sometimes your, your herb year ends are different from your points year end. So, oh, 
You can say just herbs this term. Awesome. Congrats on passing herbs. That's that's one a lot of people have trouble with, and a lot of people put that off. Uh, I remember when I was in school, some people would do it that they would just um, they would study everything except herbs, and they would just not study herbs, and they'd be like, I'm going to try to pass everything else, and if I fail herbs, I'll just take it again next semester. So that's cool that you were able to do it. Both the written part and the herb ID. I don't know how they're going to do the herb ID if they were doing it all online. That sounds like a mess. So, but congrats on passing comps. What else have we got? We're answering questions today. So we got another one in one of the comments. LI19 and LI20 both cross the opposite side of the body, just LI20. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. Remember that the large intestine channel uh, goes up and then it crosses to the other side at uh, D26. So this is an interesting question is which points are actually on the other side? Is it just LI19 or LI20? And this is kind of interesting. I've actually seen it both ways. So if we look in uh, Deadman, this is a picture from Deadman. So here it, uh, the line is coming up. It crosses over and LI19 and LI20 are on the other side. So Deadman puts them both on the other side. Here's a picture from Cam, same thing. The large intestine channel is going up. It crosses the midline and then LI19 and LI20 are on the other side. So most of our textbooks put LI19 and LI20 on the other side. But I have seen pictures like this where it's like it goes up and puts LI19 on one side and LI20 on the other side. So I have seen interpretations like this. Um, I actually don't know like what the source for this is or where we would look if we would have to look at the... Um, the, like the classic of the Golden Man or the Great Compendium of Acupuncture and Moxibustion. I, I don't know where these, um, oop, wrong button. I don't know uh, where these descriptions of the channels come from and if it even says. It's, it's like when you read the description in, in Deadman, it's actually kind of vague. It just says the channel crosses the midline at D26 and then it connects to the stomach channel at LI20. So it's not really clear if LI19 should be on one side or the other. So I'm not sure if it's actually stated. And so it's kind of an interesting question, but honestly, I've never really thought about it that much. First of all, because when I needle, I usually needle everything bilaterally, unless I'm doing like Osher points or an orthopedic condition. If someone has shoulder pain, then I might only needle one side, but for most points, I'm needling them bilaterally, so whether it's left or right doesn't really matter. And this also comes up in like point location class. If we're like sticking dots on people, we usually say locate all your points on the right side. And then students will always ask, it's like, well, with LI20, does that mean the LI20 on the right should actually be on the left? And it's like, no, just put all your stickers on the right side. And if you were doing, if you were filling out chart notes and you said, I needled LI19 or LI20 on the right side, I'm assuming you would mean the patient's right side, not that I'm using the right LI channel that crosses to the left side. So anyway, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I think that the significance here is that the large intestine channel crosses to the opposite side, and we should remember that. But whether LI19 is part of that crossing, not sure it's really clinically that big of a deal. So, um, but it does seem like most of our textbooks put it on, uh, they put LI19 crosses to the other side, both LI19 and LI20 cross to the other side. So um, basically I would believe Deadman and I would believe Cam before I believe some random picture on the internet. So that's just why I would, I would go with that. Oh, good, Doug is here. Uh, I can differentiate between an exterior condition and an exterior attack. Yeah, so it's kind of like the floating, it's the floating pulse is just telling us that there's something going on on the exterior. We can have exterior excess, we can have exterior deficiency, we can have a pathogen on the exterior. The floating pulse is just telling us that there's, it's an exterior condition, there's something going on in the exterior, we're diagnosing the exterior. I think if we have floating in a uh, floating pulse plus simultaneous fever and chills, then we can be a little bit more sure that there's a pathogen on the surface because that fever and chills is a sign that um, the, the body is fighting a pathogen, that there's a battle going on, that 
Um, basically, if you have uh, evil chi on the exterior, it, it blocks the, the wei chi from diffusing properly, so the person gets chilled or the person feels cold, and uh, because there's a pathogen blocking that dispersion of chi. But because there's this fight going on, the, the friction of that battle leads to heat, and that's why there's fever, so that's why we see simultaneous fever and chills. So if you have the two together, a floating, um, a floating pulse plus simultaneous fever and chills, then I think we can be pretty confident that we're dealing with an exterior attack. But I think when we, um, let's see if I can go back here, if my computer will keep up with me. If we go back here, um, we do have a floating pulse. We don't really have simultaneous fever and chills. We do see aversion to drafts just because the Wei Qi is weak. So there's not enough Wei Qi protecting us from the wind. So we do feel drafts but we don't have that fever and chills. If we had fever here, then we would know that the, the, the Wei Qi is, is fighting the pathogen. But since we don't have that, we just know that the, um, the Wei Qi is deficient. So I'm glad that helps. Hopefully that was clear. Ugh. It's been a rough week. I got the, I got the second dose of the vaccine and that, uh, that really knocked me out for a day. It's the end of the week and we're living on coffee right now, so. <sighs> let me know what you think about my colors. I tried to switch my colors. I have colored lights in the background, so let me know what you think about my yellow and blue. I was going to do red and green, but I thought maybe that was too Christmassy. So questions, we're answering questions. Let's keep going. Uh, this was Danielle or Susan out. This was, this was an email I got. Hi, I'm a current TCM student enjoying your website. I would like to donate, but as a one-time donation, is there a way to do that? So that's awesome that people want to donate. Um, so basically we have the Patreon and, uh, that's, a, that's the best way to support the, the website and the channel. But the, the Patreon thing is like, it's like a monthly pledge. It's like a... I mean, it's set up kind of like a, sub a subscription service. You're not actually subscribing to anything. It's like there's no extra content or anything. It's just your, it's a monthly pledge. Like if you're a patron of the arts, you're, you're, you're donating to PBS every month. Um, so the Patreon is like a monthly pledge, but I know that some people want to not do a monthly thing. They just want to give a one-time donation thing. So what I did is I, uh, it turns out there's a different service called buy me a coffee and so i just went ahead and did that what button am i trying to press Sh screen share screen share um so i set the set up buy me a coffee so there should be uh, won't will it show you the thing at the top no it won't show you the thing at the top so there should be a link in the description below and um so this is a it's kind of the same thing like Patreon. It's just a way to donate money. There's nothing extra. You're not buying anything. There's You don't get anything extra. This is just if you want to send me a couple dollars, this is a way to do it. And it's just a one-time thing. And I think it's set up that you can only do multiples of five. So if you click one, that means one coffee. And we're, I guess we're assuming that one coffee is $5 which I guess I buy the fancy coffee, so it is. Like if we go to Caribou Coffee and get like a dark chocolate mocha, then it is about $5, so I guess that's accurate. Um, so just know that like if you, if you click the three button, this is not $3, it's three times five, which is 15. But that's another way you can uh, support the channel if you want to, if you want to just do a one-time thing. Uh, otherwise, there's also a link to the uh, Patreon. Oh, and let me make sure this is correct. Uh, yeah, it's buymeacoffee.com slash study. When I first made this, I, I guess when I tried to type it out, I forgot to put the Y, or when I tapped the key, the Y didn't come up, so it was first listing me as TCM Stud, which I thought was actually maybe a cool name. Maybe I should change the name from TCM Study to TCM Stud, or that can be the, the name of the live stream, because that was kind of a, a funny mistake. Um, but the other way is, is Patreon. And so again, this, when you're, when you join the Patreon, it's more of a monthly thing. You're donating a certain amount a month. Uh, I guess technically we have two tiers, but you can type in any number you, 
you can type in any number you want. Uh, if you want to do $2 or $17, you can. But again, sometimes there's not a whole lot here. Sometimes we put in um, some behind the, behind the scenes stuff or some extra stuff. Uh, but honestly, there's not a whole lot here. If you go, if you go up to the ten dollar tier, I I've been trying to make a community website in innercircle.tcmstudy.net, and this is kind of like a private Facebook group. Uh, so far, there hasn't been a whole lot of activity on here. So at some point, I'm going to have to do something to to poke this and make and try to get more stuff going on. But the idea here is, if you wanted to ask questions, you could ask questions here, and other people I could respond or other people could respond. And so this was kind of like some people were asking about tutoring. I was like, I don't want to do tutoring. If you have questions, just sign up for this and ask questions on the community website, and we can answer them there. And so that would be like, instead of doing tutoring, you can ask questions or just come hang out and talk about Chinese medicine. So that's if you sign up for the $10 Patreon. What else? Other ways you can support the website. Other ways you could support the website is down the link. There's other stuff you can look at. Um, there's a review, you know, like you have the paid courses, the single herbs review course. I'm working on the formula course. Uh, that's probably going to take a couple months to do. So those are, those are some ways you can support the website. Um, what else? Go away, Windows. Other ways, if you go here, if you go to uh, books, uh, basically these are all some books. These are Amazon affiliate links. So if you click on any of these links, it'll take you to Amazon. And then if you, if you buy anything on Amazon, it will give me, in the next 24 hours, it will give me a small commission. I think on electronics, it's like 10%. On books, it's like 4.5%. So uh, if you look at Wang Juyi's Applied Channel Theory, uh, four and a half percent of seventy five dollars is like four dollars i think so uh this would just be another way if you're buying your books anyway and you're buying them on amazon this would be a way that it would give me a small commission so that's another way to support the the channel and the website at no cost to you i know that some people don't like amazon and they're very anti-amazon and i feel like that's a uh, reasonable attitude to have but that's another possibility another thing you can do uh i think i put a link down there is um, uh, free Audible trials also give a commission. So every time somebody signs up for a free trial of Audible, that they send me $5. And so this is something, especially if you're on break right now, we there are like one or two books on Chinese medicine on Audible. So one of them is The Spark in the Machine by Daniel Kion. Again, I know there are some people who really don't like this guy, but the book is pretty good. Um, so that's something that you can, uh, if you get a free trial on Audible, you can download that book for free and then cancel your free Audible trial and you still get to keep the book. Um, there's another one. There's some other stuff by like Jill Blakeaway. There's, there's just, there's only a few books about Chinese medicine on Audible, but that's another way. If you sign up for a free trial, they send me $5 if you want to do that. Um, it's also might be fun, something fun to do while you're on break because I think a lot of people just ended their semester and then also uh, I have a PO box here if you did for some reason want to send me something I've had some people say oh can I just send you a check instead of I don't want to use my credit card online so yeah I have this PO box that you can send stuff to if you want to send me a card or some M&Ms that's a way you can send, send things so those are ways, if you want to support the, the channel, you can. If you don't want to, that's totally fine too. If you just like showing up to the, to the live streams, commenting on the videos, uh, sharing with your friends, that's really cool. That also supports the website. So uh, don't feel obligated to send me money. Kind of the, kind of the whole point of this was to... Um, basically, it's like I know that students don't have a lot of money. Like I, like, I was in school for a long time, and I was real poor the whole time. 
And that's why to me it was really depressing that all these people were making these review materials and selling them for a lot of money. Like I remember when there were like different testing services, there used to be a CD and it's like the CD was like $300 and nobody wanted to spend that much money on a CD. And then you have the online testing things where it's like several hundred dollars per month just to have access to these practice tests. And to me, that seemed like a little bit much. It's like you're already spending all this money on your education. You're spending all this money just on taking boards. To spend more money on these review classes just seemed a little too much. So that's why I started creating these things is to try to have free resources and hopefully put these other people out of business. That um, kind of an information should be free sort of thing. So if you just want to... Uh, uh, use this information for free, that's totally fine. If you do want to support the, the channel, there are some ways you can do that. Oh yeah, I shouldn't have mentioned the vaccine. Yeah, I got the vaccine. Um, strong, uh, do you think it's strong enough way, Chi? Um, maybe? Um, I'm, I'm kind of thinking that like I have a strong enough constitution that I can handle getting a vaccine. I guess I think of it that way too, that I'm a pretty healthy person so that like the vaccine isn't going to do weird things to me. Um, I got the vaccine on Tuesday and then on Thursday I, uh, I set a max record for my deadlift. I did four, 405 pounds for four reps. And so it's like maybe the vaccine altered my DNA in a way that I now have Spider-Man strength. Uh, that would be cool. Um, but honestly, I'm one of those people that I like I think I think the vaccine is a good thing. Like I'm like I'm pretty sure like in in terms of Wei Chi, I'm pretty sure that if I got sick, nothing bad would happen. But I don't want to uh, inadvertently pass things on to other people. So just in terms of social responsibility. I think it's a good thing to do. Um, I'm not sure that the, the virus would kill me, but I'm also not sure that the vaccine would kill me, so might as well. Uh, color looks good, awesome. We're liking, we're liking the colors. Because uh, it's I had this problem when I set it to white, it actually looks blue and purple, and so that kind of freaked me out for a while. And for, for a minute there, I thought it looked like way too dark, so. What else are we doing? Oh, Q&A. That's why we're here. Sorry, I'm kind of scatterbrained today. Too much coffee. Do I have any more questions, or was that the last one? Oh, no. Uh, Natay from, uh, is from Israel, and so basically it's, he wanted to come to the live stream, but it's like 1 in the morning where he is. So he, uh, he sent me a question about uh, different schools and how they relate to each other. Five elements, stems, I'm not sure what stems is actually, but five elements, Japanese, uh, TCM, things like that. Seems like every practitioner does something different. So what's the difference between these and how do they relate to each other? Yeah, so let me know in the comments, if you're in the comments, let me know if you if you like a particular style, if you're into uh, Japanese, five element, uh, J.R. Worsley five element, or orthopedics, or what's another one, SOM, I think is a style. But yeah, basically, um, when it comes to different the different styles of acupuncture, uh, usually I start out like this. Because this is a question I get a lot, I would get a lot from students in the clinic about these different styles, and so sometimes it starts off with people are asking which style is the best, or is there a superior style for practicing acupuncture or Chinese medicine? And so I think the the first important thing to say is there's no such thing as a superior style. I kind of use the same, um, there's a saying in martial arts that there's no superior martial art, there's only superior martial artists. So you, so it's, it's kind of like sometimes you have beginners going like, oh, Taekwondo is so much better than karate. It's like, no, it's not. They're, they're just different ways of doing things. And it's really more about how you train, how you apply the style to become a superior, superior martial artist, not that the style itself is superior. And so I think the same thing is true with our different styles of Chinese medicine, that um, there's no one style that's the best. It's whether you're the best at it. So it's kind of like 
Elizabeth Talcott is a way better practitioner than me. Like any day of the week, she could, she could give a better treatment than me. But that's not because she practices Japanese and I don't. It's just because she's just all around a better practitioner than me. She's, she's more caring. She's more empathetic. She's studied her style a whole lot. She's gone much deeper into the studies. She has a lot more clinical experience and just she cares and she has so much empathy and she puts so much, um, she puts so much of herself into every treatment. That's what makes her a good practitioner. And I don't think it's necessarily because she practices Japanese style. So, um, congrats on the, congrats on the deadlift. Yeah. Um, I'll have to post a video. I'll have to videotape myself in the gym. Um, so, so I think that's the first thing is that we should, we shouldn't think that like one style is necessarily better than the other. It's kind of about how you use it. I do think that going back to this martial arts analogy that some styles work better for different people and for different situations. So it might depend on where you live and what kind of terrain you're dealing with, that if you have hard, solid ground, then maybe Taekwondo is good because you can kick things. Whereas it, where if you live on soft, squishy ground and in closed spaces, maybe Hungar Kung Fu is better because it gives you more stability. And so it might depend on that. It also depends on your own constitution, where if you're, if you're kind of short or stockier, have short limbs, maybe judo gives you better leverage that you could take advantage of your body size and shape. Where if you have really long legs, maybe a kicking martial art would be better because you can take advantage of those really long legs. So I think the same thing is sometimes just practitioners have a preference that you might find that when I do a Japanese style treatment, either that really speaks to me and it works really well, so I do that. Whereas another person is like, when I do a five element treatment, that really makes sense to me and that's what I find works really well. So I think it's kind of a personal thing. It also depends on what, maybe what you're treating, that it could be Japanese style tends to be more gentle, so it's good for a certain segment of the population who likes gentle treatments, whereas sometimes five element, I think, I don't want to say they're aggressive, but I had like a five element teacher who was like, yeah, when I needle you, it feels like you're being needled. Like, you know, you got stabbed with needles that it's, we're trying to affect the chi. And so maybe that works better for certain people who like that kind of needling style or for certain types of chief complaints. So I'm not sure where we are going with that. So basically there's, it's no like, there's not like one style that's a superior style. I think it depends on the individual practitioner and also depends on what kind of problems you're trying to treat. Secondly, um, with different styles, what was I going to say after that? I guess then we can think about like how do we explain these different styles and I think uh, maybe the second point to make is I feel like these different styles aren't actually all that different like they're more similar than they are different and so they're all based on Chinese medicine they're all based on uh, the Neijing and the Nanjing we're just taking slightly different interpretations of it so that's another thing that people ask is, what's the difference? How is Japanese style different from TCM? How is Zong Fu different from channel theory? How is J.R. Worsley five element? How are all these styles different? And basically, maybe a very basic way to think about it is whenever we're dealing with some system of medicine, we kind of break it up into different parts. We have um, different views on the anatomy and physiology so Western medicine, anatomy and physiology involves like muscles and chemicals. In, in TCM, anatomy and physiology involves muscles, but it also involves the channel system. And our view of the functions of the organs is slightly different. But we both have um, some understanding of anatomy and physiology. That understanding of anatomy and physiology affects our understanding of pathomechanism or how disease works, how we get sick and how the disease progresses. And based on our understanding of the path of mechanism, that gives us a system for diagnosis. How do we know when the patient is sick? How do we know what's going wrong? What kind of things do we look for in terms of signs and symptoms? And based on our knowledge of anatomy and physiology, that also affects uh, our treatment strategy, how we perform a treatment, what kind of modalities do we use? 
And so basically any system of medicine is going to have a concept of anatomy and physiology. It's going to have a concept of pathophysiology or pathomechanism. It's going to have a concept of how to of diagnosis. It's going to have a concept of treatment. And so basically we could say the different styles, they differ. They just have slight variations on usually the methods of diagnosis and the methods of treatment. Sometimes there's a small, there might be a small difference in the anatomy and physiology and physiology. But generally speaking, we're all using the same channels and the same points. It's usually the methods of diagnosis um, and the methods of treatment that there are slight variations on there. So for example, uh, suppose we're doing Japanese styles. Uh, let's say we're doing the I Ikeda Masakazu Japanese style. When they do diagnosis, first of all, a lot of um, Japanese practitioners traditionally were blind, and they, they felt that blind people were really good acupuncturists because they had a better sense of touch. But what that means is blind people cannot look at the tongue. So in, so in terms of our methods of diagnosis in Japanese acupuncture, they don't, there's no diagnosis of the tongue. They don't look at the tongue. But because these acupuncturists were blind, they couldn't look at the tongue, but they had very good palpation skills, so they would palpate the abdomen, and that would give them uh, different diagnostic information. So with Japanese acupuncture, our method of diagnosis is a little bit different. Instead of looking at the tongue, we palpate the abdomen. Also, it's, I guess we could say, with um, five element, with J.R. Worsley, five element, we're usually... Um, there, they're trying to diagnose a causative factor. How do we determine the causative factor? By four main ways. Color, odor, sound, and emotion. The color of the person's complexion, the odor or smell of their body, the sound of their voice. Do they have a laughing voice, a shouting voice, a groaning voice? And the emotion. Are they an angry person? Are they a sad person? Do they look like they need a hug? Um, do they laugh inappropriately? And so those are their main diagnostic signs in, in determining a diagnosis. So basically the difference in those styles are just different and we just emphasize different things in terms of our diagnosis and then sometimes different things about our treatments are a little bit different as well. So Japanese style tends to have more shallow needling. They tend to use a uh, point Pairs. I feel like they do a root treatment and they use a pair of points based on their uh, main diagnosis. So for example, if someone had lung chi deficiency, they might do lung 9, spleen 3 as their root treatment. If um, somebody was a wood constitution maybe, or a liver liver yang deficient, then they would do, or liver blood deficient, they would do liver three, kidney three as like a root treatment. So they tend to use point pairs and then add in additional things on top of it. They tend to do both front and back treatments. They tend to do, they tend to finish their treatments with uh, back shoe points. And so that's kind of the style of their treatment as they have very specific things they like to do with the treatment. Whereas when you get into five element, once they diagnose your CF, they tend to only use points on uh, your element. So if you're diagnosed as a wood person, they tend to stick primarily to liver and gallbladder points and then maybe do some other rendu points or upper kidney points, but primarily stick to it. Uh, as far as I know, J.R. Worsley five element people tend not to retain needles. They like to do five cones of moxa on each point and then insert the needle, get a strong sensation, and then withdraw it right away. And so those are just differences in technique, different, slight differences in treatment strategies. But in all those styles, we're using the same channels, we're using the same points. They're really not that different. So that seemed pretty incoherent. Um, mm, 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 mm. So I guess it's kind of, um, you can pick a style and do what works for you. Uh, for me personally, when I was in school, I took like one semester of each one just to dabble in each one. So I can't really say I'm a Japanese practitioner or a five element practitioner. It's more just, I hung out with some Japanese people and I hung out with some five element people and I have a very superficial understanding of those. Um, I will say I probably drew inspiration from each of those. Like I like a lot of the um, Japanese point combinations 
like LI10, stomach 36, I think is something they do. Lung 5, kidney 7 I, is, is a really good one. So it's like you're doing, like if you have water metabolism, it's like lung 5 is the water point on the metal channel, whereas kidney 7 is the metal point on the water channel. So I, I like thinking of the points in that way and instead of just saying, uh, Sanjiao 6 is good for constipation, Think of being, thinking the points in terms of that way. Um, mm, 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 mm. So I think it's okay to draw from those different things. I'm not sure I'm saying anything of value about this anymore. But that's, so originally our question was about the different styles. And so basically that's what I would say to students is when, when they would ask about these different styles of acupuncture, I'd say, one, make sure that there's no superior style. It's not that one is necessarily better than the others and that they're actually very similar. They're just, there are slight variations on what they pay attention to in terms of diagnosis. There are slight different uh, differences on maybe a little bit with path pathomechanism and there are slight differences in the way they perform their treatments. But I'd say on the large, they're more similar than they are different. I was going to get kind of judgmental about some of them too, but maybe I'll skip that part. JJ says, I love you. I love you too. Apparently the vaccine doesn't make you not spread the virus. Uh, I've heard different things that it's just like by reducing the viral load, you're less likely to spread it. I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't read up to, on it too much. So, um, but I do, I do feel better about uh, going to visit my family and things like that. So. Chinese herbs for reabsorption of tooth bone in the jaws. I don't know about that. Um, again, I don't like, I don't, ooh, sorry, wrong button. I don't want to give uh, specific advice. I, I usually don't like to give specific health recommendations that creates a legal and ethical thing, but it is, it is kind of interesting. I will say that when we went over, um, the formula when we were doing the formula review, uh, we had a series of formulas that talked about tooth problems. You had Xie uh, Huang San, drain the yellow powder. We had Qing Wei San, clear the stomach powder. And then we had Yi Nu Jian, jade woman decoction. And they all had something to do with toothache. And it was kind of interesting that um, when we just talk about just toothache, we usually talk about the Yang Ming channels because remember the stomach channel. Uh, enters the upper jaw, the large intestine channel enters the lower jaw, so they have something to do with teeth. So when we have like toothache or bleeding gums, we might think there's heat in the Yang Ming channel. But then with those formulas, one of our differentiating factors is for something like Qing Wei San, we just say toothache with bleeding gums because there's heat in the stomach. With Yi Nu Jian, actually one of the distinguishing symptoms is loose teeth. And kind of the idea is with uh, Jade Woman decoction, it's not only is there heat in the stomach, but there's also some underlying kidney yin deficiency. So the idea is that the yang ming channels go to the jaws and go to the teeth, but the bones belong to the kidney. So kind of the idea with that formula is by tonifying kidney yin, by tonifying kidney essence, that can strengthen the bone. Um, so I guess for any, any kind of this uh, bone loss, I wouldn't necessarily think about reabsorbing bone. I would just think about uh, different strategies for tonifying the kidneys, at least in a TCM perspective. There might be a, there might be other ideas from a Western perspective in terms of minerals and things like that. But I know some people are really into bone broth and stuff like that. Or we can think about um, tonifying the kidneys, just because the teeth are bones, the kidney governs the bones, stuff like that. Do I have any other questions? No, I think that's my last one. Yeah, that's my last one. So if you have any other questions, let me know in the comments. Otherwise, I might just cut it short and go to the gym. Oh, here's something I was going to say when we were talking about the Patreon. Um, so what we did a while ago, what we did the last uh, several weekends is I did like a review of all the herbs, all the, all the formulas that are on the NCCUM list. And that was just a live, a live stream and that's recorded. 
Um, but what I'm going to do now is go back and record each individual chapter and make it look a little bit nicer and put more graphics in it and turn that into a formula review course. So that's something I've been working on lately. I'm not sure if this is going to... Oh. Sorry, it's giving me buttons. Let's see if this works. Does this work? Yeah. So this is what I've been work as I've been working on this, trying to make a um, put all this. Uh, I, I recorded the first section. I'm not sure my computer's fast enough to do this. So I just recorded the first section on herbs that release the exterior, and so. Uh, Hopefully this will look a little bit nicer than just that live stream that was going on. And I'm not sure if the audio is actually coming through. Anyway, so that's that's kind of what I'm working on now. And basically what I'm thinking, it's, it's probably going to take me a long time to get through all of this because it's like I've spent a week just on the first chapter, just on herbs that release the exterior. So it's probably going to take a long time to get through that. And... Um, So, so I think what I'm going to do is, as I as I finish each section, I'll just upload it and make it available to the to the Patreon, just so you can kind of see the progress. And then, hopefully, I'm kind of actually kind of hoping that people on the Patreon will look at it and give me some feedback and make sure I didn't make any spelling mistakes or anything like that. And so that'll be like I'll be like uploading the rough draft to the Patreon. So that's another thing. If you want to join the Patreon, that's something we're going to do for the next couple months. Is uh, as I finish these sections of the formula review, I'm going to upload them to Patreon, and then once I get them all done, we'll package it into another paid course, and we'll have all those sections. There'll be some handouts to go with it. There'll be some practice tests to go with it and everything like that, and then it'll be a paid course, but I might put it out piecemeal on the Patreon. So if you want to uh, join the Patreon, we'll I'll post those, but I'm not sure what the timeline is going to look like for that. So I guess the other thing about that is... Um, if it's like if I'm not uploading videos to the YouTube channel for the next two months, it's because I'm recording these formula review videos, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully once we once we have the single herb review course and the formula review course, hopefully that'll give me a, a full time income that I can actually just make videos and make enough money off of that to pay my rent, and we can just keep making videos. Uh, did you take formula for symptoms after you got the second dose of the vaccine? I didn't. And this is something, this is kind of a weird thing. I've, I've heard people discussing this on Facebook groups about like, should you take, uh, should you take herbs to mitigate the symptoms of the vaccine? Um, cause some people are like, oh, it's kind of like when you get the vaccine, you kind of have sometimes have like fever and chills and it, it's kind of like you're getting sick. So you can use uh, herbs to mitigate some of those side effects. And then other people are like, well, no, part of the point of the vaccine is you're trying to stimulate your immune system. So it's, you kind of want it to take its course. So that way your immune system is doing the work and getting stronger. And so there are different opinions on that. Um, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't, I just kind of felt crappy for a day. And so I just took a nap. So I didn't, so I didn't take anything. Also what happened both of these times is, uh, I wasn't sleeping very well this weekend and I was like, I've been like drinking way too much coffee. And so it's like, I'm not sure if it was actually the vaccine or if it was just like, I haven't been sleeping and I'm going through caffeine withdrawal. It could have been either one of those. Um, but basically I, I felt not so great for a day and I'm self-employed and I live alone. So I just took a nap and then the and then the next day I, I felt totally fine. Um, there was some shoulder soreness, but then I I went to the gym and I I did lateral raises just fine. My medial delt was sore for a little bit, but it went away pretty quickly. Started buying M Nums after seeing you. Oh, it's a dark road. Yeah, I, I've been I've been trying to avoid the the peanut M Nums lately because I've been trying to eat healthier. But I did get a package of peanut M Nums the other day. What I've been trying to do lately is uh. I'll eat, uh, I get the fun size packets of the regular M&Ms and eat them in the middle of a workout. And so I'm telling myself that it's like, it's good to have a source of fast digesting carbs in the, uh, int as intra-workout nutrition. 
Uh, I think that's just a made-up thing, but I do uh, eat M&Ms sometimes in the middle of the workout. Sometimes I just do it to, like, troll other people at the gym where it's like, I'm eating candy at the gym. I think I think Arnold used to do that. When he would go to bodybuilding shows, he would, like, in, in, the, in the show prep, he'd be, like, eating McDonald's uh, hamburgers while all these other guys are trying to get pumped up for their show. Uh, I'm trying to see if there's any other any other questions. I didn't really have a whole lot prepared for today, so so I guess that's a that's another question I can ask. Is sometimes we do uh, sometimes I like to do specific topics for the live stream, and sometimes we just do Q and A. So if you have a specific topic you wanna you wanna discuss, maybe we can do that. Um, so let me know in the chat or in the comments if there's like a general topic you wanna discuss, like before we we're doing. I don't remember what we did before, but I feel like we've done things before where it's like a specific topic where you're talking about like how to review herbs or how to study or things like that. If you want to talk about a topic, let me know. Also, uh, earlier this week, I, um, I got invited onto a room in Clubhouse. I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with the Clubhouse app. I'm not. That was my first time on the Clubhouse, but they invited me to this uh, TCM room on Clubhouse to talk about making a YouTube channel. And that was kind of fun. So that I guess that's another question for you is uh, let me know if you're on Clubhouse and let me know if you're in, you would be interested in doing a Clubhouse room. And so if you don't know, Clubhouse is an audio platform. And it's basically, it's kind of like having a conference call. It's audio only. There's no video. And it's not recorded. So it's only live. You can't listen to it later like a podcast. It's only live. Um... And so that's something I got invited to, and I tried it for the first time. But uh, let me know if you want to, uh, if if you'd be interested in doing a, a TCM, like a version of this in Clubhouse. And I thought maybe that would be something to do with the the Patreon. I feel like I don't do a lot of stuff for the Patreon members, so maybe we could have a Patreon only Clubhouse uh, room. So so let me know uh, if you'd be interested in that. What kind of topics you would like to talk about, and what what's it like a good time? That's another thing I have a problem with is. What's a good day and time that people can actually make it? Um, and I think now I have like five invites. So if anybody needs a Clubhouse invite, I think I have like five of them now somehow. So I can, I can, I think Clubhouse is invite only, but I can invite you. Um, yeah, I don't know. And it's like I, I'm thinking about doing Clubhouse more, but I also, it's, I've heard of people like wasting their lives away on Clubhouse. So. I might do it a little bit, but I kind of want to. I kind of want to moderate it. Um, boo, 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 boo. Thoughts on autism in Eastern medicine? That's actually something I don't know a whole lot about. Um, I feel like there are probably people who specialize in that, and there are probably very specific theories about that. But actually, I don't know a whole lot about that. And it's it's also one of those things that we don't talk about in. Like in school, you don't always see it a whole lot just because I think traditionally there's no concept of autism. I mean, I, I, I kind of remember this like sometimes we were in classes and people would ask about like, what's, what, does te what does Chinese medicine have to say about ADD or ADHD? And the Chinese teachers were just like, that wasn't a thing in ancient China. Or even like allergies, like how do we, how do we treat allergies? It's like allergies is a very common modern complaint, but traditionally people just didn't talk about allergies that much. So it's like we don't we don't have a lot of like classical insight as, into things like allergies, ADHD, or autism. So, um, so I'm not really sure. I guess I'm not even sure like how I would classify the symptoms. So that's that's something I would have to um, I would have to research that before I. I don't want to say anything and just pull things out of my ass, so I'm, I'm not really sure. Oh, how to communicate popular TCM common concepts to patients would be an interesting topic. Ooh, yeah, I feel like that's something I'm not very good at. Um, and But this is an interesting discussion. I think we talked about this with Patrick on the podcast sometimes. Because it's kind of interesting that you have some people that like to completely avoid saying anything about Chinese medicine in front of the patient. 
like like you would even see this with like five element practitioners they would talk in code so instead of saying like oh this person has a liver lung block they think oh if you say that in front of a patient the patient is going to freak out they're being like what's wrong with my liver do i have do i have hepatitis do i need to go see my doctor so they don't mention anything about tcm so they'd be like oh yeah i think this guy has a four or five block and just to avoid saying anything TCM in front of the patient. Whereas like on the podcast, when you talk to Patrick, he does the exact opposite. He educates people about TCM and says, this is how we're diagnosing you in this traditional system. This is what we think is going on in this system. And he has a good way of kind of explaining it in a simplified way. Sometimes he'll use like plumbing analogies. That's basically, it's like, chi is flowing through your channels like water is flowing through pipes and we got we got like you got a clog in your pipe here so we got to clear that out we got too much here we're going to divert it over to here and so he has very good ways of explaining some of that to his patients and some patients are really into it some i think are really not some they just want you to stick needles in them and they don't care how it works they just want to feel better some people if you try to explain it to that to them in that way they're going to think you're uh, a crazy new age person and they're not going to come back. So it kind of depends on the patient. Some people are really into that. Some people are really not. Some like some people appreciate uh, learning about the traditional aspects. Some people want to think of it more in a modern way that I'm, I'm stimulating nerves to affect the nociceptors and the way the brain feels pain that we're down regulating cortisol. They really like that. Other people are like, oh yeah, I'm going to ground you. I'm going to ground your energy and calm your shen. You got too much energy going upwards. We're going to do your window of heaven points to let the light of the, the sky shine in. Some people are really into that. So it kind of depends on the person. Oh, awesome. Mustafa is working on a cruise ship. And, and I guess I'm just assuming that you're doing acupuncture on a cruise ship because that's a thing that people do. So I guess I'm, I'm assuming that you're, that's what you're doing. You're not just like a Disney character on a cruise ship. But... um. I'm always curious to know how that goes because I've had some people have uh, doing acupuncture on cruise ships. I've had some people have really good experiences and they love it and they sign up for multiple contracts and other people are like, it was terrible. They lied to me that I thought I was going to make this money. I made $50 and it was terrible. So I have uh, different, uh, different things. Oh, can you explain Herb is grouped in the family, like the book 10 Key Form? Yeah, I really like that book. And that was actually kind of, I was thinking, I had some thoughts about this when I wanted to do a formula review course. I was thinking, should I organize it the way that Bensky organizes it when we go through by category? Or should I organize it in terms of those formula families that we have like a Guager family? Uh, just because then we have a lot of formulas that are based on Guajir Tong, but they're spread a different, across different categories. So Guajir Tong and Xiaojian Zhong Tong have very similar herbs, but they're in very separate categories, but, so it would make more sense to talk about them together. So that might be um, a different one. That, that, might be an, that might be an interesting topic to talk about, but I feel like that would be like really in-depth. I would have to like actually study and prepare a lot for that. So um, maybe that can be like a, an, an actual video. Because that would that would be kind of um, that would be kind of interesting, and I do think um, how beneficial when we get used to it. I because I think that's also interesting when he uh, talks about those formulas. He's saying that there's like there's a Guajir body type and constitutional type, and there's a Chai Hu uh, constitutional type, and so you would choose different formulas from this family based on their chief complaint. So it's like if somebody comes in with um, with a Guajir body type, but their complaint is uh, like blood stagnation sort of things, then you would then you would choose Guajir Fuling Wan, where if a person came with a Guajir body type, but they had stomach pain, then you would choose Xiaojian Zhong Tong. So it's kind of an interesting way of looking at those things. So that would be interesting. Um... Yeah, yeah, and so that's what I was thinking of saying instead of grouping it into categories like the textbook. Yes, yeah, so that's what I, that's what I was thinking about with the with the formula review. Is it would it be would it make more sense to actually do it that way? And so it could be that maybe I'll with that review if I have enough time, maybe we'll go straight through in in the textbook way, just so that people who are in their formulas classes can follow along and make sense of it. 
but then maybe we'll do like a part two where we think about it more in terms of these families and how to how to think about the herbs that way. Uh, also, I have, I've been having a lot of fruit flies, so if anybody has good suggestions on how to trap fruit flies, I've been leaving out uh, dishes of red wine vinegar, and I feel like that's not helping at all. Um, so I need, I need some better options. Maybe I need to go get some actual red wine instead of just using red wine vinegar. Uh, there was something else I was looking at. Oh, beard. Yeah, somebody was asking about beards. Where was the first one? Oh, beard routine. Um, yeah, I've had people comment on this before, like like online and in real life. Actually, I, I, I think that happened at school at PCOM once when like, I was supervising in the clinic, and the guy next to me was like, so tell me about your beard. Um, I'm not sure I have anything exciting to say. I think my beard might just be genetics. Uh, I don't really do a whole lot to it. I know that some people, like there are some hipsters who are really into it, that with getting specific beard shampoos, beard oils, and combing it and things like that. I really don't do anything like that. I just wash my face like a normal person. Um, and I trim it. I, have, I just have a regular beard trimmer. Um, I was going to say, I had one guy who told me you should trim your trim your beard line so it comes up closer to the front of your chin and then goes back down and kind of makes like a point. And he was like, oh, that makes you if, you, if you let it go too far, you're going to look like you have a double chin, so really come up. So I used to do that, and I didn't like that. Now I go more of a U shape across, so it just come, comes about too soon above your laryngeal prominence and, and make that. So that's how I do the um, do the thing. I'm glad you're amused by the fruit flies. Um, they've been super annoying. I think it's I, I think I was overwatering my plants and I got some like infestation in some of my house plants. Uh, but they like buzz around at weird points. And I have so many house plants I don't know like which one it is. And so I tried just like, oh, I'm just gonna stop watering my plants for a while. And now like all my plants are dying and I still have fruit flies, so um but yeah, beard routine, I just kinda trim it. Uh um, maybe use shampoo and conditioner on it. I don't know. I have some beard oil, but I never use it, so I don't know. Oh, one thing I will say is when the when this guy was asking me, he wanted like a he's like you have such a full beard. Uh, one thing you can do is when you get clippers. So basically, uh, right now this is pretty short, so I usually set my clippers to a three. But if you if you use the trimmer and you go up, then that will trim your beard really short. But if you want to like grow out a longer beard and have it be fuller but still have it be neat, still set your clippers to a three, but then trim down, and that way it'll kind of like it'll get the scraggly stuff that comes up, but it'll still uh, let the beard grow and become fuller uh, without having it look like you're homeless. So if you go up, you'll get like a very short trim, like it will actually be uh, three eighths of an inch if you go up, but if you go down, it'll just make sure there's nothing poking out. What is a needle? I'm not sure if that's like deep and philosophical or what. I'm not sure how to interpret that question. A needle is a needle. I think it's kind of interesting that um, technically it's not a needle. Some people call it a pin. Uh, I thought that was kind of weird that people call it a, some people call it a pin instead of a needle, which technically is probably true. It just sounds funny to me. Do you have opinions on homeopathy from an Eastern perspective? Not really. Um, I, I kind of think of them as two different systems. I feel like homeopathy, was that a Swiss? I think it was a Swiss guy or a German guy who, who started homeopathy, so. I don't really know. It, to me, it's just like they're different systems. If they work, if they work, do them. If they don't work, don't do them. It's just it's kind of like with like uh, trying TCM and Ayurveda. They're two different systems, and and if people, no, no, nothing bad about people who wanna, um, nothing bad about people who wanna study that system. It's not like one system is necessarily better than the other. I think it's it's if you're gonna study a system, it's better to stick to one and really understand it. Don't try to dabble in five different systems because you're just gonna be crappy at five things instead of being good at one thing. Um, but in terms of trying to interpret it from TCM. 
No, I don't, I don't really know much about it. Um, unless we say something in a very vague way, it's kind of like we can say homeopathic versus allopathic. It's kind of like, are you using a contrary treatment or a with the thing treatment? And I know some people have tried to argue that um, Chinese medicine does both, that sometimes you might use hot herbs to treat a hot condition or something like that. I feel like generally we say that yin and yang counteract each other, so we would not, so most of our treatments are allopathic and we're, if a person is cold, we give them heat. If a person is hot, give them cold. But I do think there are some certain times where we would use um, a similar treatment. The only thing that comes to mind is that um, if somebody has diarrhea due to excess heat or excess damp heat, then we might actually use purgatives. So we do have formulas that we use da huang to treat diarrhea. And you'd be like, this person is already has diarrhea. Why are we giving them something that will uh, purge the large intestine. And it's kind of like we're trying to purge out that damp heat. So that might be an example. But in terms of like homeopathic remedies that you're like, I'm going to use 30 M Roost Tox. How do we interpret that in TCM? I don't know. Oh, we're at about an hour. I think, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. I will drink even more coffee and I will eat some waffles and I will go to the crappy gym. And those are my plans for the weekend. Tiffany and Mallory are coming to visit. I'm not sure if we're gonna make videos or not. It could be that I could convince them, or they. it's really more like they would have to convince me to do a point location video, because I hate doing those point location videos. It's usually Mallory that like bugs me about doing those point location videos. So if they, uh, if they, if they bring dots, then maybe I will uh, do a point location video with uh, Tiffany or Mallory, or we'll just eat waffles the whole time. Why excessive heat can become cold in the body. I would have to think about that and think of an example of that. Because I think it's easier to find examples where cold transforms into heat. It's like cold causes stagnation and that stagnation turns into heat. I'm trying to think about heat turning into cold. Because usually usually that we could have true heat with false cold, like in, in terms of stagnation, if everything is stagnating in the middle, then your core will feel warm, but your extremities will feel cold. But that's not really excess cold, that's like false cold due to lack of circulation. I'm trying to think of excess heat becoming cold. Unless it's just like the, sometimes we can have excess heat starting to burn away the yin and yang and can eventually deplete your resources and become cold. But that's kind of like becoming a deficiency cold. I'd have to think about that and think if I can find any examples. So I'll think about that when I'm, when I'm at the gym. Trustworthy list of most used herbs for starting a pharmacy. Uh, this this is kind of a, a thing that a lot of people ask, and because um, it's kind of like, especially whether you're starting a raw or a granular pharmacy, it can be, it, like it's really expensive. There are a lot of herbs, and it's like, do you need all these herbs? It's kind of like, uh, so like my friends in Kentucky, like Patrick, he's a real hipster. He wanted to have every herb, even herbs that nobody uses. So he has like, he has Lucien Sao, he has scorpions, he has Tsumu, he has all these herbs we didn't even learn in school. Um, but uh, it's like normal people probably don't want to buy it. It's like, why would you buy a pound of herbs and when you like, it's used in one formula and you're never going to use it. So one thing I might think of is just think about what you're treating and think about what are the formulas you would likely prescribe and then think about those herbs. So it's like you probably definitely need like Huang Qi and Baiju and Shu Di Huang and things like that. So if you think about, just think about what kind of patients you're seeing and what kind of formulas that you're, uh, you're probably gonna be prescribing a lot of Bu Zhang Yi Qi Tong, a lot of Gui Pi Tong, a lot of Liu Wei Di Huang Wan, um, Swan Zhou Ren Tong, and kind of think, and a lot of those formulas have very overlapping herbs with like, all the, all the formulas are based on Sujun Zetong and Su Wutong. So I might think about like what kind of formulas you're likely to prescribe and then buy, and then start with those herbs and it's like you can always add on more. 
I mean, shipping for herbs, for bulk herbs is kind of expensive. You usually don't get free shipping when you buy herbs, so sometimes you don't want to just buy things piecemeal. Um, but sometimes what I would do when I first started, like I bought a whole bunch of bulk herbs, and then if it's just like, oh, I need nine grams of rote song wrong, then I would go to a different pharmacy and, and just buy a small amount of rote song wrong when I needed it. Um, so... I'm not sure if that was so, so I guess I don't have an actual list, but I would think about what kind of things that you're going to treat. It's like a lot, of, not a lot of people come in, at least in, a, in the West, a lot of Americans don't come in when they have an external attack. So if you buy uh, the 50 different herbs that release the exterior, it could be you're never going to use them just because most Americans don't think to uh, come in for Chinese medicine when they have a cold. So maybe you don't need to do that. But if you, but it is real common for people to come in for insomnia. So having some of the the Liu Wei Di Huang Wan, the Swan Zhao Ren Tong, the Tian Wang Bu Xin Dan, having those types of herbs it might be good to stock up on those instead. So that's that's why I think about what formula is going to treat. Um, erectile dysfunction. Yeah, maybe that could be like a whole topic because that's an interesting thing. Because uh, first of all, it's it's basically when we. Erectile dysfunction, a lot of people tend to go immediately to kidney yang deficiency. And I think what people forget is we all, the other common pattern, kidney yang deficiency is a deficiency pattern. We also have an excess pattern that's liver chi stagnation. Remember, all the liver channels go up and encircle the genitals. So it's like the liver channel encircles the genitals. The liver lul channel goes up to the genitals and stops. The liver divergent channel goes to the genitals. So we have to think about the liver channel as well. And so it's possible that there's an element of liver chi stagnation, not necessarily kidney yang deficiency. And so this is something that kind of comes up is sometimes you get like 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds coming in with erectile dysfunction. If you're like, oh, we need to tonify kidney yang. It's like, do you really think a 20-year-old man has kidney yang deficiency? I mean, if it's like a 60-year-old man, probably go to kidney yang deficiency. But if it's like someone in their 20s, I'm not sure they have kidney yang deficiency. Maybe it's just a liver chi stagnation problem. So then so then we can start to ask things like is stress a factor? If you get like really stressed out or really nervous, does that exacerbate the symptoms? Then we can maybe go to more of a liver chi stagnation. Whereas if it's just like, no, I can never I um it doesn't matter about stress or anything like that, then maybe it's more of a kidney yang deficiency. And then sometimes people we can at, start asking questions like does the erectile dysfunction only occur when you're with a partner? Or basically we're asking, like, can you masturbate okay? Like, when you wake up in the morning, do you have morning wood? Do you have, like, an erection in the morning? Or does it only happen when you're around your partner? Or is it just, like, you never, you can never have an erection? That's maybe a differentiating factor that we can say. Maybe it's the stress of the liver chi stagnation is causing erectile dysfunction versus an underlying deficiency causing the erectile dysfunction. So that's kind of an interesting topic. Um, it's also why I think like when we study single herbs, uh, the, the category herbs that tonify yang is like the largest category. There are so many herbs. And really, I think the, the reason it's the largest category is uh, back in the day, the people who wrote the books were the physicians who were, um, they were the court physicians. They were the, the, the doctors to the emperor. And back then they were like, they were really concerned with that emperor having offspring. And so it's like, a lot, I'm, I'm just assuming that these uh, old doctors, that a lot of their study was dedicated towards making sure the emperor could still get it up so that he could have children. So that's kind of my conjecture as to why herbs that tonify yang is so large. It's just a very well-studied category because they were real interested in making sure they could uh, get it up. Yeah, and, and I feel like this is also a thing of, um, yeah, this this is probably a whole video because it's also surprising that we're, I've been seeing a lot of younger people and so then we get into the topic of um, is pornography and masturbation having an effect on erectile dysfunction and um, I'm not sure there's, a, there's like a lot of stuff on the internet about that. I'm not sure if there's a lot of actual research about that, so that's an interesting thing. Sometimes we even have to ask questions about, like, what do you mean by erectile dysfunction? And so that's that's kind of when everybody, when any, whenever anybody comes in a chief complaint, you have to be like, what does that mean to you? Or what does that look like to you? Because sometimes I've had people come in, they're like, 
Um, ooh, go away. Um, like one time I had a guy come in and was like, oh yeah, I'm having, I'm having problems with erectile dysfunction. It's like, okay, well, what's that like? He's like, well, I used to be able to, uh, masturbate four times a day and now I can only masturbate one time per day. I'm like, dude, you're 40 years old. That's like normal. Like why you like, why like four, going from four times a day to one time a day does not mean there's something physiologically wrong with you. That's normal. Or, um. Or like a, I had a guy come in with, he said he had low libido. And I was like, oh, so what's that like? And he's like, oh, well, like my partner wants to do it six times a day, but I'm, I'm only able to do it one time per day. And it's like, I don't think you have low libido. I think maybe it's like something going on with your partner. So sometimes we have to ask those questions about like, what do you actually mean by erectile dysfunction and things like that? And then we have to, then we still have to do our pattern differentiation. You know, I think we shouldn't just automatically go to kidney yang deficiency. I think a lot of times there's a, a liver, a liver chi stagnation, uh, is another possibility. It could be a combina combination of the two. But if it's if it's a younger person, I might tend to go towards liver chi stagnation first. Where if it's an older person, then I would go to a kidney yang deficiency first. And um, and you also just got to like, get a lot of creepers coming in, too, that they want to, they just want to take off their clothes. I think that was a good way to end it. We'll see, uh, we'll just end it there. I'm starting to get a little hoarse. So we'll just end it there. Um... Yeah, so maybe that's something we can, we can talk about. Because uh, I do have a book. Uh, one of my teachers wrote a book on male health, uh, like andrology and TCM. And so he goes uh, goes over some of the patterns in that and talks about some of the stuff. So that might be a good uh, a good thing to good thing to go over. Or it might be a good like maybe I should make a CEU course or something like that. So we can we can think about that. But I think we'll end it there. I think we've been going long enough. I should go do things with my life. And uh, like I said, if we're not if we're not uploading things to the YouTube channel in the next couple months, it's because I'm working on this formula review course. Uh, if you want to get updates as to when I work on those sections of the formula review course, I'll be posting those to the Patreon. So if you want to go to the uh, Patreon page, uh, we can do that. But in the meantime, we'll keep doing... Um, Weekly live streams, we'll try to do every Friday at 11. If you have topics you want to talk about, let me know. If you have questions that you want answered, leave them in the comments below. Uh, I may or may not be working on the podcast. It's just been a little bit difficult trying to get people to actually come on the podcast. So we, we might have podcasts coming out, or we might not. We'll see. But we'll try to do live streams. Uh, again, let me know what you think about Clubhouse. If we want to do a Clubhouse, we can we can try that. We just need to make sure that people like to show up and actually ask questions. We can try that. But in the meantime, again, uh, thank you to the Patreon members for supporting the website, supporting the channel. If you want to do some support, we there's some a bunch of links in the description below about how you can support the channel. Some of them are at no cost to you, but we appreciate the Patreon members. I think that's it. I'm going to go to the gym because that's like all I do with my life. So we'll see you here next week. Have a good weekend. I'm assuming most people are on break too. It's, maybe this is just like I'm too uh, Pacific College centric, but I think most people are on their uh, are on their spring break. So I hope you have a good spring break and you have something to do. If you just uh, took your year ends, uh, congratulations on passing your year ends or uh, my condolences for not passing your year ends, depending on what the case may be. But that's, uh, that's all for today. We'll see you next week. I feel like that camera is like, should have tilted that. Kind of tilted that camera up a little bit more. Oh well, it's fine. Take care, we'll see you next time.